So this is a video for chapter 10, which is all about uh, something called confidence intervals. And this really begins our first discussion of something called inference, which is a term I think I've used before. What we mean by inference is using a statistic, that would be something like x bar or p hat, to estimate an unknown parameter, and the parameter, remember, would be something like mu or p, which, remember, we started talking about uh, parameters at the beginning, we said the parameters are actually unknown. So, because we actually can't really know them without actually doing some census of the entire population, we use a statistic to estimate some unknown parameter. Turns out that inference is really a big topic and something we're going to be doing really throughout the remainder of the year. Um, inference problems kind of break down into something called a confidence interval and something called a hypothesis test. Um, you can see here I wrote that really chapter 10 is all about confidence intervals. When we get to chapters 11 and 12, we'll still be doing inference, but it'll be a slightly different kind of inference called a hypothesis test. And this next couple slides are really um, meant to give you the um, kind of foundation between how is it that sampling distributions, which we did in chapter 9, relate to confidence intervals. And just like last chapter broke down into the big distinction between means and proportions, you're going to see a similar thing going on in chapter 10. In this video, I'm going to kind of, again, lay the foundation for confidence intervals. Um, and just trust me, there will be some formulas coming down the road. Um, but then section 10.2 is all about confidence intervals specifically for means, and 10.3 is all about confidence intervals specifically for proportions. So you'll have that kind of same distinction you did back in chapter 9 about is it a means problem or is it a proportions problem. This video is really meant to kind of talk about both a little bit and kind of lay the foundation. And I'll kind of give the ideas for both of them, and then really in sections 10.2 and 10.3 we'll talk about the formulas. Okay, so this uh, example, which comes from your book, um, I'm not going to read it all for you, but notice how the last question, um, I can, pa can pause the video if you want to actually read it, um, but notice how the last question says, what can the director say about the mean score mu of the population? Again, this is getting that core idea of inference. There's no way to really know mu for the entire population unless you want to do a really expensive and difficult census. So we're going to use this statistic x bar to make some kind of conclusion about, or some kind of educated guess, about the unknown parameter mu. Um, for the purposes of this problem, I wrote this over here. Let's say, hypothetically, we know sigma is, sigma for the entire population now is 15. And we'll talk a little bit about how you might know that actually later on. This question could be interpreted as give a confidence interval. So in the next couple of slides, I'm going to walk you through exactly what that means. And notice I kind of asked a question here. How would the sample mean x bar vary if we took many, many samples of 50 freshmen? Well, this is totally is based on chapter 9 for sampling distributions. We know the mean of the sampling distribution is mu, so that's remember this formula from last chapter. We know the standard deviation of the sampling distribution. Here's the formula from last chapter. Right here's the math. We get about 2.1, right? So we know the mean of x bar is going to be about, uh, well, actually, it's going to be mu, but we don't know what mu is, right? This is an important idea. Um, but we do know that uh, 2.1 2 is the standard deviation of the sampling distribution. And more than that, we know that the sampling distribution is normal because of the central limit theorem, because, look, our sample size is about 50. Um, so the central limit theorem tells us that's more than 30, so the sampling distribution is normal. Again, nothing new uh, from last chapter. And again, this problem is really getting at the idea of inference, right? Look, this is inference. We're using an x bar to estimate an unknown parameter mu. We don't know what mu is. So is mu 112? Well, probably not exactly. Our x bar was 112 but it's probably pretty close to 112, right? And when you think about the ideas from last chapter, we can actually kind of think about, based on our normal curve, like how likely is it that it's pretty close to 112? And that's kind of what the, where we're going with this. So again, kind of laying this foundation, let's be a little more specific, right? To estimate, oops, excuse me, to estimate mu, right? Let's start with x bar, right? We don't know what mu is, but it's likely it's pretty close to x bar. So let's just kind of use that as a starting point for our guess. Now, is mu exactly 112? Of course, probably not, right? Unless we got really, really lucky. So our estimate we know has some error, right? But we know that in many repeated samples, x bar follows a normal distribution. Here's the mean of the sampling distribution, and here's the standard deviation of the sampling distribution. A little bit different here. We don't, we're guessing that mu is 112, right? We don't actually know that. But we're, it's, it's, a, it's the best guess we can make at this point. So now we're getting really close to kind of laying the foundation for a confidence interval. So let's say, hypothetically, that we want to be 95% confident. And I just kind of picked that number out of the air, and this term 95% confident you're going to see later on. 
Why did I pick 95? Because it's the middle number of the 68, 95, 99.7 rule. So 95% of the time, would you agree that x bar will be within two sigmas, two standard deviations of mu, right? That's based on the kind of two sigma idea from up here. Well, if x bar will be within two sigmas of mu, you can just reverse that. Wouldn't it be the case that mu would be within plus or minus two sigmas of x bar, right? Because actually, we're just talking about how far away these things are. So if we can kind of reason that x bar must be within two sigmas of mu, well, then vice versa, mu must be within two sigmas of x bar. Again, all we're doing here, there's going to be some formulas coming, but I'm just trying to lay the understanding of the confidence interval idea. So with this kind of key idea that I wrote in the previous page, right, we know that we're 95% of the time mu is within two sigmas of x bar. So I wrote mu is within x bar plus or minus two sigmas. We knew what sigma was from the previous thing, right? Wasn't it 2.1? Okay. So we can say, let's actually just calculate these things out. x bar minus two, point, two sigmas, x bar plus two sigmas. Look over here, we get, uh, we get two numbers, right? which are 107.8 and 116.2. That's kind of the end, the, out, the bounds of our confidence interval. So let's see this sentence down below I wrote in red. We're going to write things like this a lot. I am 95% confident that the true mean IQ score, that's mu, which we don't actually know, is between 107.8 and 116.2. That sort of lays the, this is how kind of the understanding of a confidence interval, right? And see how it directly follows from doing that uh, normal, that is sampling distribution things we did in chapter nine. Okay, there's gonna be some kind of formulas, but I wanted you to see all this first. This is this this red sentence is kind of the answer to a confidence interval question. You're gonna be writing these sentences a lot, and it's important that you understand exactly kind of what that means. And we'll get some formulas in a second for how to calculate these two numbers a little bit more easily than I just did in this video. So let's kind of be a little bit more specific here, right? Our confidence interval uh, that we just calculated in the previous example looked something like this, right? And all confidence intervals sort of follow this pattern. And so in general, I wrote up here, every confidence interval is going to follow the same thing. It has kind of two parts, statistic plus or minus margin of error. And you can see that down here. The statistic is this x bar that is 112, okay? And then the margin of error is everything after the plus or the minus. So this whole kind of 2 times uh, 15 over root 50, or we're going to call it z star, and I'll talk about this terminology in a second, um, is the margin of error. Everything after the plus or minus uh, is the margin of error. A confidence interval also has to come with something called a confidence level, right? And... Before, in the previous example, I just kind of picked this kind of arbitrary thing. I wanted to be 95% confident. That's where the 2 came from because we knew the 68, 95, 99.7 rule. Typically, problems will either give you a confidence level, which is often 95%, but sometimes it might be 90% or 99%. Those are probably the three most common ones. And then you're going to have to calculate kind of this number, which might be a little bit different than 2. But usually the questions will say something like find a 95% confidence interval. But I wanted you to see this kind of important idea, statistic plus or minus margin of error. Okay, we're going to have a formula that's going to look like this. You can kind of pick out the parts and see how those parts relate to the example I did before. You'll notice on my previous example, when I wrote that sentence in red, I used the term I am 95% confident. A rookie mistake that uh, beginning stat students make is sometimes they don't use that phrasing they instead use what they think is a synonym, and they say there is a 95% chance. That's wrong, and I kind of want to give you, so don't never, ever, ever say there's a 95% chance when you're talking about the idea of confidence intervals, and I want to try to give you some justification for that, um, why that's the wrong thing to say, because it's a, re it's a really common rookie mistake. So once you construct a confidence interval using a specific X bar, if you think about it, when you take a sample, that gives you one specific X bar, and so the, the kind of process I just showed you will give a confidence interval around that x bar, okay? Well, there's really, once you have a confidence interval, if you think about it, any different x bar you make will give you, any particular sample will give you a different con confidence interval. You can kind of see that over here. See all these dots and kind of in the middle? Those are specific x bars, right? And so you can see that every time you get a different x bar, if you took a different sample, and then did that whole process, you would get a different confidence interval for each specific x bar. 
you can see actually this is the idea of many, many samples and many, many confidence intervals. Well, here's the true value for mu. It's right here. And I think one thing to think is actually just because we don't know mu, once we construct any one of these confidence intervals, there's only two possibilities. Either mu is in the confidence interval or it's not, right? Just because we don't know mu, we don't know which of these two possibilities there is, but one of these things must be the case. So if you said there's a 95% chance, it's the wrong thing because there's no chance left. Once you have one of these confidence intervals, mu is either in there or it's not. And there's, we don't use the term chance anymore because there is no chance left. The equivalent I used in class is imagine I asked you to draw a card face down and put it on your desk. Right? If I said, what's the chance that this card is an ace? Right? You might say 1 out of 13, but that's actually not the way we think about probability. If the card is face down, the probability of an ace, it either is an ace or it's not. We don't know what it is, but there's no chance left, right? There's no, there's no chance left. It either is an ace or it's not. Just because we don't know whether it's an ace, we wouldn't use the term chance there. So this is kind of a key idea. There's no chance left. Once you construct a confidence interval, mu's either in there or it's not. It's either an ace or it's not, but there's no chance left. It either is or it isn't. So don't use the term chance. Now, that's why we say I'm 95% confident is kind of a way of getting around that idea.